Welcome on into the Wolverine.com podcast. Clayton Safey here with Anthony Broom on Thursday, February 8th. I'm going to break down the latest with Michigan's coaching staff under Sharon Moore, closing in potentially on a defensive coordinator hire. We will get to that in just a second. But first, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like the video, subscribe to our channel uh, as we uh, continue to climb towards 30,000 subscribers. And head to the Wolverine.com. All the latest intel there on the coaching staff, NIL, transfer portal, Michigan football, basketball, and recruiting. And a special offer just for podcast viewers and listeners. Promo code UM1 at the Wolverine.com gets you two months of premium access for just $1. So check us out over there. But yeah, like and subscribe. Greatly appreciated. Uh, Anthony, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, man. Um I- Another week where things are still kind of in a holding pattern outside of, you know, obviously since the last time we were on here, Mike Elston uh, is set to head to the Chargers. But other than that, it seems like things are finally starting to come to a head with getting some stability with some of the staffing hires. A couple hours before we we jumped on here, I saw that the, the, uh, the careers page had a football general manager position uh, yep. posted, which again, whether they have someone in mind for that, or not doesn't matter. It needs to be posted publicly, as we knew from the Sharon Moore hiring, uh, given that state law. So moves being made, uh, things coming together. I think that uh, you know between the two options of things being a quote unquote disaster and things being super stable, there's nothing to worry about. Truth probably lies somewhere in the middle in terms of of getting this staff figured out and moving forward uh, with some of these uh, these big consequential decisions coming up. So. Feels good. Uh, Again, I think we're going to have clarity on a lot of these things sooner rather than later. And I know Michigan fans have gotten used to hearing that and get frustrated by hearing that sometimes. But I think uh, logically speaking, that's where we're at right now. And it's good to be back here discussing it with you. Yeah, we'll talk about Steve Klinkscale and his status uh, in just a little bit. But let's start with the defensive coordinator. Um, You look at, you know, kind of the two names this week that really popped up and appeared to be the the two guys on the top of Sharon Moore's wish list was one, Joe Cullen, the defensive line coach of the Kansas City Chiefs, who's getting his team ready right now to play in the Super Bowl on Sunday against the San Francisco 49ers, but was a defensive line coach for the Ravens for five seasons, coached with both Jesse Minter and Mike McDonald, also coached with Don Wink Martindale who we'll talk about in just a minute as well. But, uh, you know, seemed like yesterday was kind of the big day, Wednesday, where they were talking to him, weren't able to lock him down. And it seems like, you know, maybe he was a little bit hesitant. Hey, I'll, I'll wait till after the Super Bowl. Well, you know, Michigan kind of wants an answer. Uh, you know, it seemed like at the same time, and they're going to kind of move forward with their search. And the next name would be Wink Martindale, who we will get to. But, um, you know, look, I, I think that, there are times in these assistant coaching hiring cycles that you don't always get your first choice for every position. And, you know, someone said, well, oh, you know, Jim Harbaugh, these, some of these guys, Jim Harbaugh's taking weren't really his guys. Cause you know, McDonald was the first choice over Minter and, you know, Mo Linguist was the first choice over Steve Klinska. Like that's just not how it goes. You don't always get your, your top guy. If you're an assistant coach, you're not always at the exact place you want to. It's rarely your last stop. So these things are a fluid process as we've kind of talked about throughout the last couple of weeks. Um, so, you know, Michigan not able to lock down Joe Cullen, at least for the time being, but doesn't seem like that's going to happen. And now you move on. Yeah. Something I wrote earlier this week is that because there have been people that have been a little underwhelmed by the hires so far um, or the reported names. And the fact of the matter is, is that one, given the timeline that all of this went down, no, you don't exactly have a laundry list of, of top sexy candidates. If you want to use that word, lining up for some of these positions because coaches are either locked in where they're at. They're preparing for spring football. Um, You know, Michigan's coaching change was kind of late, uh, later compared to most of them. A lot of these things happen in December for college football programs and they get those sorted out and locked in. Um, You know, Sharon, Sharon Moore has a duty not to appease social media, not to appease the message boards by bringing in a name that everyone recognizes um, you know, he needs to one. I mean, yes, the higher you make needs to be able to satiate the guys that are on the roster now because you don't want that exodus. But at the same time, if there is some collateral damage that comes out of the decision that he ultimately makes, 
you got to live with that because he's not just putting his staff together for 2024 it's for 2025 2026 right you know, this is a long-term build now this is his program this isn't this isn't a stopgap. I know he was brought in for or one of the one of the benefits of having Sharon Moore was the implied continuity that came with it. But he also had to sell a vision and sell what he wanted the program to look like, too. So, um, you know, with Colin and, and just one thing on Colin really fast. I know the elephant in the room is the Wendy's incident from 18 years ago with the Lions. I don't like, like it. Again, it, it yeah, it, it makes it makes for, I guess, funny banter or, or whatever you want to call it, fodder, whatever it is. Um, the man's been sober for 18 years and, and I don't, it just, he's a pretty darn good football coach. And I think would, would be a good hire if he would have decided to, to come to Michigan. Um, and who knows, maybe something falls apart with, with wink and they circle back, but you know, pushing a guy for a decision four days before the Super Bowl, that's um, it's a unique and not the best timeline for, or at least one side of the negotiation. So for me, uh, I think you also need to be careful too. Uh, now, again, we'll, we'll, maybe I'll just save that. What I was going to say next for when we talk wink, but um, you know, they've been, they've been steadfast. They want to keep that same sort of Ravens defensive scheme, the style that Mike McDonald and Jesse Minner ran. Um, yep. It's pretty clear at this point there, it might be a variation of that with whoever you bring in. Um but at the end of the day, I think it is important to keep at least the tenets of that system in place because it has been the secret sauce that's kind of unlocked all of this for Michigan over the last three years. Right. And why wouldn't you keep it in place? And, you know, you could have done that with an internal hire, maybe Mike Elston or Steve Klingskill. And, and maybe it's not out of the realm of possibility if they, you know, if they miss on some more targets that it ends up being Steve Klingscale, um, who, who we again, we will talk about in a little bit. Uh, but I, I think it's pretty clear that they want to do that. And I think it's pretty clear that that was the obvious path to go. If you're Sharon Moore, uh, let's talk about Wink Martindale. But before we do want to talk about our commemorative issue of the Wolverine magazine, uh, celebrating Michigan's national championship. We have 144 pages of stories, analysis, interviews, columns from the Wolverines, 15 and 0 2023 national championship season. You can order in the link in the description of both the video and the podcast or at the Wolverine on demand.com. We have both the uh, soft glossy cover, uh, just like the uh, football preview magazine that we do each summer. If people are familiar with that. And we also have a hard, a hardcover book with uh, no ads uh, for a, uh, a marked up price, but it's going to look good on the coffee table. AB, I'm not going to lie. It's, at least it's going on. Mine. Yeah. And I flashed it. If you're watching the video, I flashed the football preview uh, from this summer on the screen. It's, Obviously, the soft cover version, that's more or less kind of what you can expect structure-wise. Uh, we have been able to look at the page proofs and the PDFs of how this is coming together. And it's so exciting to see all of that stuff um, on paper. You know, with us in particular, you kind of get bogged down in being in the trenches for it. And I won't say not enjoying it, but when you start thumbing through what this thing is going to look like, um, it kind of brings back a lot of, you know, memories from each week and specifically the last, you know, six, seven, eight, nine weeks of the year with all that was going on. So it's going to be great. Uh, you guys are really going to enjoy it. I think the the plan is, and if I'm speaking out of turn, feel free to correct me. I think these, um, the regular edition will probably be out mailboxes sometime later this month with the hardcovers sometime in mid-March based on what we're told. So uh, it's coming along. This thing is done and in the hopper. Uh, they are proofing it. They're laying it out. And I believe it will be sent to the printer sometime in the next few days. So it's so exciting. And it definitely, I hope you guys are able to get your hands on one because its uh, they're not going to last forever, first off. And two, really cool keepsake uh, from what was, I think you could argue, the best season in program history. So get yours today. Yep. Get it this week uh, to guarantee that you do get an issue. We will have some inventory as well afterwards, but the pre-orders going on right now. And like AB said, it will ship out in late February and then the book version will ship out in mid-March, but you're going to keep this one for decades. So make sure to go to the wolverineondemand.com or visit the link in the description. Uh, let's talk about Wink Martindale. Um, and Anthony, we, we were talking before we hit record here, like the more I read about him and I've watched a couple of press conferences as, you know, just kind of, doing some some different work around here and 
he's awesome. He's a football guy. I mean, those of us who follow the NFL have, have known who he is for a long time. I never thought that he would potentially be a hire at Michigan. And again, it's still potential, but you know, let's talk about his candidacy, the interview uh, going on today at some point here on Thursday. And it's a really interesting one because Mike McDonald was the linebackers coach under him. Jesse Minter was a secondary coach under Wink Martindale in Baltimore before they both branch out. You know, in 2021, Jesse Minter goes to Vanderbilt, runs that defense. Mike McDonald comes to Michigan. Minter then comes to Michigan the last two seasons. Um, you know, and they were all running the same system, essentially. Obviously, different variations. They all have their own personality as a play caller. But he ran the Baltimore defense for four seasons, was let go after the 2021 campaign. That's when Mike McDonald headed back to Baltimore to run that defense. But, you know, they, him and John Harbaugh both kind of said it was, it was time. You know, they struggled a little bit. They had a lot of injuries that season. Uh, but they were top three in the NFL in scoring defense his first three years as their D coordinator. They finished 26th in his final year. But, again, had a ton of injuries that year. Marcus Peters, Deshaun Elliott, Marlon Humphrey were all hurt at different points in the year uh, and a couple of other guys as well. Then he goes on to the New York Giants, brings a couple guys with him as well that we can talk about who may also join him at Michigan. They have some success in year one. This past year didn't go as well. Him and Brian Dable, the head coach, kind of clashed a little bit. And uh, that led to his exit, which was you know pretty much him resigning from the New York Giants. And you know Dable, from what you read, is is kind of a tough guy to work with. And I'm sure you know there are two sides to that story as well. So it's not like it's it's nothing to to talk about that they had that clash. But I guess your initial thoughts on uh, Wink Martindale? I would like it if they're able to get it done. I mean, this is uh, and again, just like anything, there are polarizing opinions on it. You know on. Namely on, again, not calling it out, just our message board. There's a lot of people, a lot of opinions on there. Uh, feel free to again, use that promo below to get in on that as well. Uh, but when you talk to football people, uh, specifically people who covered Wink uh, with the Ravens and, and with the Giants, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people see that as a fit, especially given what's mi what Michigan has run the last few years. And, and there's been, now again, the differences between what, McDonald and Minter were running and what Wink likes to run is it seems like it is a little more man to man. Uh, and somehow the narrative on our board emerged that it would be like hiring Don Brown again. It's not, uh, it's, it's nothing like that. Uh, in fact, if you go through and look at some of the, um, you know, you look at some of the man versus zone stuff, some of the games the giants have played over these last few years, there has been a lot of zone mixed in and, and it's, you know, I would say, you know, talk about hiring someone with the tenants of that Michigan defense. Now, McDonald and Minter ran a variation of what Wink was running in Baltimore under John Harbaugh. And there was a parting of ways because in the NFL, that happens. Um, teams figure you out and you got to adjust. And sometimes you're looking for a different voice. And that's why, uh, you know, anyone who thinks that he's a retread type of guy, you know, it's just the NFL is, is brutal. It's cutthroat. It's one of the reasons why Jim Harbaugh is being kind of ruthless in hiring his staff because um, you don't have much of a win. You know, if you don't win in the NFL at the highest level, your window to be there isn't as long as it might be somewhere else. So uh, for me, Wink Martindale, again, it's not, uh, you know, stop short of calling him, you know, the godfather of the defense that Michigan wants to run. But uh, I think it's a guy that fits. I think when you have a first time head coach, especially a guy who is um, you know, from an offensive background, I, I like having a guy with with experience and gravitas essentially being the head coach of his side of the ball. So uh, for me, I I would have a hard time I would have a hard time really criticizing this one, um, especially, you know, with all the personnel they have coming back. Um, you know, I would think you would still be pliable enough in terms of scheme, in terms of what you want to run to work around your players. And Michigan's got a lot of pretty darn good ones coming back assuming everyone comes back, um, you know, with that, the portal windows open and whatnot. So for me, again, stop short of calling anything a home run. I don't think there's any, I don't think there is such thing as a home run hire. There is no one-to-one -one replacement or plug in for anyone else. But to me, I think given your timeline, given where you're at, I think it would make a lot of sense. I think there are home run hires, but you don't really find out until they hit the field in, in the fall 
And, you know, I think that that's going to be the case with this Michigan staff, you know, Sharon Moore promoting different guys, you know, analysts like JB Brown to, to special teams coordinator. Like you can't really judge a hire like that until they get out on the field. Same with Grant Newsom moving from tight ends to offensive line. It seems like a natural fit. I mean, Jim Harbaugh mm -hmm. even talked last year about how, Hey, he's going to be the O-line coach one day. He's going to be the offensive coordinator after that. We're going to keep promoting him until we can't promote him anymore. You know, that was certainly something that was going to be in the works at some point, you know, whether Sharon Moore went on to be a head coach somewhere else and they needed an O-line coach or whether they're in the, the need for one now, because he is now the head coach at Michigan. Uh, that stuff is, is, you know, seems natural. seems like good fits, but you don't know until they get on the field. A uh, couple things about Wink's defenses. One that, that you really like and that shows a lot of similarity to what Michigan has done, of course, because, you know, the guys that were running Michigan's defense the last few years came from his system, but they rank much higher in scoring defense than they do in total defense. You know, they're going to allow you to get some yards in between the 20s, but they're going to be stingy in the red zone, kind of the, the bend don't break type of scheme that Michigan runs, especially one that you need uh, against Ohio State that we've seen work so well the last three years. The one that we saw on full display in the national championship game against Washington when, uh, man, you know, they kept everything in front. They only allowed one pass play of 20 plus yards, and that was for 44 yards in the fourth quarter when Michigan had a big enough lead anyway. So that sort of stuff, the stuff that we talked so much about under Jesse Minter and Mike McDonald, I think can stay intact. They finished top three in the NFL and scoring defenses first three years as the DC of the Ravens. Again, slipped a little bit in year four, a lot of injuries. Offense wasn't good um, it, either uh, at different times. A year later, they end up replacing, um, they end up replacing Greg Roman with Todd Munkin from Georgia. And it's kind of the same situation. They just needed a different voice. Like you said, I think that's a great, a great word to use. And they go with Todd Munkin out of Georgia. It doesn't mean Greg Roman wasn't a good offensive coordinator. Jim Harbaugh, John's brother, just hired him as the OC at Los Angeles. So just because there was a parting of the ways there, just because things kind of went down like they did in New York, doesn't mean that you know that he's damaged goods or anything like that. I mean, he's been around the NFL for a long time, coordinated multiple defenses going back to you know 15 years ago when he was the coordinator with the Broncos. Um, but you know that's one thing that stood out to me. And then the, the second thing that stands out to me when you do some research on his defenses is this guy likes likes to blitz. So maybe in that respect, he's a little bit uh, a little bit like Don Brown. But I don't think the comparison is really that apt. But in 2018, they ranked first in blitz rate. In 2019, they're first. In 2020, they're first. 2021, they were eighth. I don't know what happened there. Down to 31.1 percent. Uh, then with the Giants in 2022, first in the league in blitz rate in 2023 second in the league in blitz rate so he likes to bring pressure um you know they run simulated pressure as well some of the stuff exotic stuff that we saw specifically under jesse minter who you know which i i loved and, and thought was huge and really helped confuse opposing offensive lines but um you know i think those things are all all kind of positives and like our chris ballas wrote this morning He's going to have to adapt to the college game, right? And and he's probably going to be willing to do that and understand what he's going to need to do in the college game to win. And I guess that leads me to this question for you, A.B. Is he 60 years old? He hasn't been in college since uh, 2003 when he was coaching uh, a couple years before that and with uh, Jack Harbaugh at Western Kentucky. So the Harbaugh ties run, run that deep. But your thoughts on him having to recruit, on him um, – you know, having to adapt to a, a different level of football that he hasn't been in, in, in over 20 years. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to recruiting, I've always felt, and I know depending on the guy, like our recruiting guys might push back on this, but I've always felt like recruiting is just communication and relating to people and having a vision to sell for the guys that come into your program. So again, I don't know, I don't know Wink's background enough to know if, he would be successful in that area. I think, like I said before, there is like a presence and gravitas that he would bring to him. Um, I mean, look at him. Look at the sunglasses. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing right here. If you're watching the video, the B-roll itself, how do you recruit to Michigan? He's wearing a Baltimore Ravens hat and a New York Giants hat. And I know the Giants haven't been, you know, what they were maybe in those, you know, with, you know, historically. But that a guy that's been successful, and really Giants people will tell you, kind of was the the reason that that team was kept afloat 
over the last two years, given that that offense isn't, hasn't been all that great there. So again, how's he going to recruit? What kind of staff would he fill out around him? Listen, I mean, I'll just say this about Wink is if he winds up being the guy, I think ideally what happens from there is that you have a younger, you know, you have a younger group of position coaches around him. It's not at all. Unlike yeah. what we've seen at Michigan in the last few years, you get someone to eat, sleep and breathe that defense and kind of be his right hand man. And then you pass it off in a year or two, because again, if, if there is a, um, I know this has kind of been the, the narrative with the head coach, but if there's an NFL opportunity that he wants, I assume Wink Mark Martindale would probably leave and take it. So um, it kind of goes against what I said earlier about not grabbing a name and not just worrying about 2024, but this would be the case where I think you can afford to plan ahead by surrounding him with guys that you see having that trajectory uh, of being that play caller. And we'll talk about, you know, what that means for St Steve Kling scale here in a bit, but I know if it's wink again, you talk about how sometimes you need a different look and you need a different uh, voice on your defense too. And, and make no mistake about it. You prefer to have Mike McDonald or Jesse Minter still around, but at the same time, they have what? I have to do math here really quick. 28 plus 15. If teams have 43 games, you know, 43 games of film on this Michigan defense now from over the last few years. And, um, you know, it's every offseason. You got to go in and add some kind of tweak and make yourself, um, you know, adjustment proof, so to speak. So certainly adjustments that can be made, certainly adjustments that likely will be made. And again, this isn't uh you kind of have to hit the ground running here too, because this isn't, you're not going to have nine weeks of run up until you play a game that matters next year. You got Texas in week two. You're going to play Oregon. You're going to play USC. You're going to play Ohio state. You're going to go play at Washington. It, it's not, you know, this is where I'm kind of on board with keeping that continuity there in terms of what you do defensively for just 2024. I, I think I'm okay with that. What happens after next year, we'll see. Uh, but in terms of keeping that nucleus intact, I think that Wink right now, given everything we know about what's out there, is probably your best shot at that. And it's not going to look the same, but um, I think it will, will look similar enough, should look similar enough to keep guys happy that we're maybe considering looking around or what have you. Yeah, I think once he gets in a room with some of these guys, and our Chris Ballas reported – over on the Wolverine.com this morning that I think that's even going to happen maybe in the interview process where they let some of these guys, you know, meet some of the guys who are interviewing and, you know, understand what the potential vision, what the potential fit would be like, what the personality is like. And I think that's smart. Um, and that's not uncommon. I, I don't think either, but it's something that I think Sharon Moore wants to do. And I think that is smart. And look, Wink is, you know, he's 60 years old. He's kind of an old school guy. He blitzes a lot, you know, but he is a player's coach from everything that you read. He let NFL players at, at both the Giants and the Ravens call the defense during some preseason games. Like this is a guy who loves his players. I was just watching a press conference of him talking about the guys on his defense that made the pro or made all pro in the pro bowl this past year, how proud he is of them. Like, you know, the growth that they've had, like this is a guy that is going to relate to the players just because he's on the older side. It, it does not mean that he's not going to at all. Um, so I, I think that that could be a real plus. And I want to go back to what you mentioned. I thought that was really interesting with, you know, this may be a guy who would get another NFL opportunity And look, I think the Cowboys are looking at him right now too, for the defensive coordinator job. So it's not a slam dunk that Michigan's able to land him. But again, we're talking about a potential hire here where let's say he does have a good year, good two years at Michigan. If he does come here and, and run the defense and gets a call from another NFL team, which is certainly possible. He's, He's been a coordinator now for you know, several straight seasons and many in the NFL throughout his tenure. You have guys that will be around, continue to run this defense. You know, if Clink's here next year, it's year four of him in this in this system. And the next year would be year five and, and things like that. You have those guys. We also talked about a week ago when Mike McDonald got the head coaching job of the Seahawks, how it makes it tougher to hire a defensive coordinator because he got that job. He's looking for one. Jim was looking for one, took Minter uh, as, as expected. John had to promote from within to get his D coordinator. Like it limited some of the candidate pool for Michigan. But now with all these different head coaches out there, Jim, John, McDonald, 
Sharon Moore running this defense, there are going to be other candidates to to potentially bring in if you do lose a guy. And I know this defense is kind of becoming the hot thing in the NFL, but that is something that could benefit them down the road. So you want to keep this defense because it's been so successful. And, you know, it's kind of it's kind of the thing right now. And I think there are going to be more candidates down the road if you look at it in the future for Michigan to to choose from. Well, think of it too. I mean, you've almost got a, again, I'm not, it's different, right? I, I think I put Mike McDonald in more of the Ravens tree than I do the Michigan tree, but he did have that one year there. And it's kind of like coast to coast. You kind of have like this spreading of the, um, I call it a, a plague or a disease. That is the mission, you know, that style of defense. So it's a disease for offenses. Yeah. Yes. You've got a foothold now in the nation's capital. You've got the foothold in Ann Arbor. You've got Pacific Northwest covered. Uh, with uh, with Mike McDonald in Seattle. You've got Harbaugh now out there with the Chargers. So, you know, again, um, it's it's why I don't necessarily, you know, just looking at all of these hires so far in general, um, you know, especially when you look at guys like Steve Kasula, J.B. Brown, those are all, like, the reason to be optimistic about hires like that is because those are guys that have been here and that Jim Harbaugh, had a direct hand in either hiring or mentoring and signing off on them being around. So, um, you know, the key thing for Sharon, as we've said, is he's got to run the program the way he wants to, but there's also a lot, you know, what we've seen over the last few years is like this steady line of succession sort of built from the analysts, from the grad assistants to position coaches into coordinators, into, you know, guys that are head coaches now. I mean, Jesse Minter, if he has a good year with the Chargers, maybe he's an NFL head coach this time next year. So um, continuing to keep that line of succession going um, and how I, you know, how you tie this back to Wink, you know, it's, it's a guy that it's a guy with gravitas that sets a tone that, that mentors a bunch of younger and hungry guys and, everyone kind of gets dispersed. Like ideally that's how this works here moving forward. And I don't know. Um, it could just be, you know, if it's wink, it could just be a band aid for one year. We don't know. Um, but ideally that's sort of the direction this, that this heads here is that, you know, you keep the, you know, you can't replicate a Jim Harbaugh, but you can replicate the culture and sort of the setup of putting talented people in roles and elevating them when it's time to succeed and uh, maybe something Michigan can improve on is keeping and retaining some of those people moving forward. But that's a conversation for another day. Uh, right now we'll see what happens with this, the rest of this staff, but if it's, if it's wink, I think that's a really solid hire um, about the best hire you could probably make right now. Mm -hmm. I agree. And uh, you know, part of the exit, in New York was that Brian Dable kind of went behind Wink's back and fired outside linebackers coach Drew Wilkins and his brother, defensive assistant Kevin Wilkins, and told Martindale that. I guess that was a pretty heated meeting, according to uh, a really good report from The Athletic. Um, there were some, you know, colorful words exchanged, I believe. And, you know, that kind of led to, to Wink wanting out there. But I think those are guys that could follow him to Michigan from what we've heard and, you know, could be guys that would help fill out this defensive staff. Another guy who seems like he's going to be on this defensive staff moving forward is Steve Klingscale uh, or Chris Ballas reporting again on Thursday morning that he is likely to stay at Michigan. Jim Harbaugh was trying to court him to the Los Angeles Chargers, and that could still happen at some point. I mean, at one point it looked like Ben Herbert was going to stay, but then it seemed like Los Angeles up their offer and he ends up with the Chargers in the NFL. So not saying that, you know, this is a completely done deal, but it does seem like he has, you know, given the indication that he's going to stay. And, and look, I mean, I think Steve Klinkscale probably wants to be the defensive coordinator at Michigan. He's the co-DC right now and secondary coach. But it definitely feels like Sharon Moore wants to go with an outside hire, somebody with experience running this defense. Joe Cullen checks that box. Certainly, Wink Martindale checks that box. Maybe the originator of this defense, and you know that's kind of the direction they're at right now. But it's not a small thing that Steve Klinkscale is likely to stay at Michigan because of 
the job he's done with the defensive backs over the last three years, the job he does on the recruiting trail, you know, he's, he's a culture guy too. I mean, he, he just keeps things, keeps everybody in line. I mean, it is funny. Like I know I've mentioned this a couple times, probably throughout the years on the show, but anytime you ask a guy what it's like to play for Steve Klingscale, their first inclination is to start laughing. You know, they, they let out a little chuckle. Um, and then, they say that they love it, but it's not an easy thing to, to play for Clink. But he he gets these guys better. He develops them, and they end up loving him at the end of the day. And I think that's just a guy that you need around on this on this defensive staff. Yeah, I mean, having him stick around is key. I mean, Will Johnson is a guy that kind of came to Michigan ready out of the box. But when you look at the guys that have developed under his watch, and remember, it was a Remember everyone panicking after Maurice Linguist left for Buffalo? Um, was it just before the spring game or just after? I forget what it was exactly. Yeah, it was like it was well after. Yeah, it was like almost in the summer. I think like April or May. Yeah, when you look at you, I just think back to that COVID season when uh, what the primary corners were was it Jamon Green and Vincent Gray? Does that sound right? In uh, going the into COVID season. Uh, yeah. Yep. I mean, you look at, I don't want people to have to relive this and think about it, but when you think about how Michigan lost that Michigan State game that year, and then you're pretty much running it back with those type, those guys that next season under Clink, the strides that those guys made yeah. was incredible. Um, and then DJ Turner breaks out, uh, you know, obviously you have Will Johnson break out last year, Jamon Green develops, you know, all of these guys this year. Josh Wallace, a guy comes in from UMass, probably pretty ready to play, but develops into, you know, an all Big Ten caliber type of cornerback. So, you know, with Michigan, they go into next season with a lot of the same questions that they had going into last season in terms of who's going to be that number two um, on the other side of Will Johnson. Who's going to be, you know, Mike, Mikey Sainer is still gone. Who's going to play the nickel? This guy, I think, is, is maybe the most critical of the guys that were, you know, left or that are left and are on the board probably the most critical guy left to retain because I do think he has a Midas touch on the recruiting trail. Uh, I think he has a Midas touch in terms of developing and cultivating talent uh, in the secondary. And again, listen, um, all of that being said, you know, if Sharon, Moore, you know, look how quickly Sharon Moore made his decision on offensive coordinator. Like he said at the press conference, he had a guy in mind that, to call the plays, you know, if, if a guy like, Steve Klingscale or a guy like Mike Elston, if he had that type, that same type of conviction about them as candidates to run this Michigan defense, I think that would be done already. And it's no disrespect to get you know, to those guys, but um, who would know better than a, a coordinator or a guy that's been on Jim Harbaugh's staff as your new head coach that has been in the room with these guys. And it's not, again, it, it, no disrespect intended at all. I think Klink and really Mike Elston, are, are phenomenal position coaches. And, and you see that on film with the guys that they develop, but yeah. you know, with Clint, maybe Clink is one of those guys where a year or two down the road, uh, you know, he, he develops that feel for calling a defense or whatever it is. And he's your next def defensive quarter. I don't know. He's going to keep that co-defensive coordinator tag as long as he's, uh, as long as he's there for now, it seems like, and you know, I get it. It's a coaching change and, and there might be some, some rough feelings at times, but you know, when the dust settles and if he's still on the staff, it's go time. And I don't think there'd be sour grapes. I don't think there'd be some kind of mutiny or anything like that. Um, that's a guy that's very much all about his business. And as long as he's at Michigan, I think that will, that will remain the case. I agree. Um, so yeah, we'll continue to monitor that. We'll continue to monitor really throughout the, the next hours and days on, um, uh, Wink Martindale, his candidacy for Michigan defensive coordinator, where things stand there. Let's finish with this. Michigan basketball knocks off number 11, Wisconsin. We got like, a, let's just take a minute on uh, Michigan basketball getting a big win. First yeah, win uh, it, in a while. <laughs> they deserve, like, hey, listen, you know what? Jokes aside, uh, 8 and 15 looks a hell of a lot better than 7 and 16 does. It's a win over it and a, a ranked opponent. Really, I thought one of their better 40-minute efforts of the season, um, and it wasn't without its warts. I mean, a lot of the things that they that frustrate you are just kind of woven into what they are and what their roster construction is and things like that. But 
I thought that from wire to wire, those guys played pretty darn well in that game on Wednesday night. So it was good to see, again, you know, the thing that's so demoralizing now is that that's something that you, you'd think you could come out of that and hang your hat on it as, as okay, let's, let's salvage some goodwill moving forward. Well, now you play two straight road games and Doug McDaniel won't be on the floor. So we've seen how that kind of handicaps them um, in terms of their chances of winning on the road. But for one night, in a sparsely populated Chrysler Center, not to, not to pile on there or anything like that. Those guys showed up, and and by the end of the game, they had people on their feet, and, and the fight song was playing. So it was it was good to see. Um, again, it, need to keep playing that way to salvage any type of goodwill down the stretch here. It's still, so many questions, but for one night on Jawan Howard's birthday, mind you, uh, yeah, really good effort and, and good to see. And I give Jawan Howard credit for, in the second half, he kind of had that group. It was working a little bit. Jalen Llewellyn at point guard. Um, you know, Olivier Kamwa off the floor. Doug McDaniel off the floor for 11 straight minutes. Kamwa off the floor for eight straight minutes. And he kind of stuck with the group that, you know, they weren't playing great. I mean, it was kind of just a back and forth type of game. And there were a few moments where you thought maybe they were going to lose, you know, they let things slip a little bit like they've done in most second halves recently. But he stuck with those guys. Then he brings back in Kamwa at the three and a half minute mark. Doug at the one and a half minute mark. He makes a big uh, layup. I mean, I, I give him credit for switching things up and talking to Terrace Reed after the game at, at his press conference. And he said they heard the comments after the Rutgers game when Jawan said, maybe I should play my walk ons because they care. And he said, that's real. You know, that's real motivation. And the guys in that locker room definitely heard that. And as they said, they did. And you could tell that, that there was just a little bit more fire there on Wednesday night. And they also didn't get the best effort from Wisconsin. I think that helped as well, but I was listening to Fred Hoiberg, his press conference after, you know, they lost to Northwestern last night and he was saying, man, you know, we got a good Michigan team coming in. I don't think Michigan's all that good, but you know, point taken uh, that, you know, and he mentioned that they just beat Wisconsin last night. Now Michigan won't have Doug, as you mentioned, but I think if you're in Nebraska, you're looking at it as a tougher test, especially, um, with some of the losses that, that they've suffered recently. And then Michigan State, I ventured over to the Spartan Mag message board earlier today. They're, they're not thinking things next Saturday night are going to be such a uh, slam dunk of a win for them at Chrysler. So that one gets a lot more interesting now that Michigan has proven it can actually play well enough to win a basketball game, right? Yeah. I mean, again, this team has flaws. The roster has flaws. I think that a lot of the things they do are just inherently flawed. Um, but this is this, this roster and, and to me, the talent on it, this isn't the 14th worst roster in the big 10. I, I mean, I don't know how much higher than that they are, but this isn't the worst team in the big 10 on paper. A lot of the things they've done have allowed them to be that way. Um, which is why it was encouraging. Again, I looked at you last night uh, at Chrysler and said, Wisconsin's only, are they really the 11th best team in college basketball? And that stuff doesn't really matter this time of year. Um, rankings and whatnot, but you know, to see this group, I don't, I won't even say flash its potential, but just play a really quality basketball game against a team that you know is is good, is objectively good, maybe not great, maybe not a, a contender or anything like that. It just it, it kind of makes what's happened before that a little disappointing, given that. You know, if you could just close out a couple more games here or there, maybe you're you still probably are are pretty firmly out of the NCAA tournament bubble, but hope's not dead. I mean, hope was dead for this season before we even flipped the calendar to January 1st. But for one night in a vacuum, liked what I saw and, and would love to see more of it because it was it was a group that had fight and a counter punch, and it hasn't had that a lot this year. So a uh, job well done to Juwan Howard. Uh I thought pretty well coached game, pretty well played game from everyone. So like I said, good to see overall. I'll leave everyone with this stat. You look at Ken Palm's efficiency ratings. Michigan is currently the best eight win team in America. Not joking. You can look it up yourself. <laughs> so if that makes anyone feel any better, then there you go. Is there, is there a postseason tournament for, for that? Is there a, I mean, yeah. they, they're going to get a CBI invite or CIT. They're not going to accept it, but there technically is a postseason tournament for that. Oh my goodness. Um, so that's where they're at. Best eight win we'll team. See. In the country. Hey, I mean, at this point, 
you're just looking to play spoiler and and with Michigan State, you know, a week because that's Nebraska and Illinois, that's that's gonna be really tough, super doubtful. Uh, Michigan State, that's a team that's on the ropes right now. And it would be kind of funny if they won that. It would have been funny if they found a way to win that one in East Lansing without Doug McDaniel, but uh to kind of send that program into it in into a bit of a tizzy after how that what the expectations were and where they're at right now would be be kind of funny objectively speaking but that's where my thoughts on all of it end <laughs> it would be brutal loss to minnesota a couple nights ago for michigan state but we'll see how it all plays out continue to follow along over at the wolverine.com again promo code um1 gets you two months of premium access for just one dollar please like the video and subscribe to the channel if you're watching on youtube and we will see everyone next time